What's going on guys, this is Rob, and if you're enjoying the content here on my channel, then make sure you hit the like button, and make sure you hit subscribe so you can help decide what direction the content on my channel goes in, in the foreseeable future. Okay, so continuing our whole thing about Superior Spider-Man, uh, this is when we actually delve into, uh, you know, really Spider-Man 2099. Now here's gonna be the kicker to, the, to, to this whole thing, here's gonna be the craziness, is like the middle of this story, there's going to be like a singular moment that takes place in this story, and it's gonna be one panel and then another panel. Between those two panels, the entirety of Spider-Verse takes place. <laughs> and it's kind of crazy the way that Dan Slott did it, uh, but it was still really, really cool, and, and we'll, we'll cross that bridge when we get to it but what we do here is we actually pick up with nueva new york uh, which is i'm sorry nueva york which is basically new york in the year 2099 um but what i want to do here is i want to have a little bit of a discussion about miguel o'hara spider-man 2099 now this version of 2099 that we're seeing here is not the traditional spider-man 2099 universe instead that's actually referred to as earth 928 and remember whenever it comes to futures in marvel comics it's to say you know 20 years from now or 100 years from now or something like that those are usually always considered considered to be like, you know, alternate realities. They're usually always considered to be like dystopian futures or something like that, or sometimes they're enlightened futures. But because of the fact that that future is not guaranteed, Marvel just kind of chalks it up to an alternate reality. Now, aspects of that future may be guaranteed, but the future in and of itself, in terms of how we see it, is not guaranteed to happen. With 2099, traditionally, that is to say the, you know, Spider-Man 2099, 1992, Peter David run, what it basically happened is that there was a massive civil war between humans and mutants. And eventually it led to the point where the earth uh, basically experienced this systemic breakdown of social classes in the sense you basically just had the super rich and then everybody else. And so what it did is it basically created a very corporatized environment where there was nonstop advertising, everything was corporate. It was 100% if you weren't rich, you were basically poor and you were living your life as best you could. Um, the idea here was that at the time, because of the fact that, that heroes like Spider-Man were really kind of considered to be archaic, they were reminiscent of days gone by, Miguel O'Hara had actually become part of a group called Alchemax. And the idea was that Miguel O'Hara himself looked to the idea of Spider-Man and then eventually took up the mantle. Now, this coincided with like a new generation of superheroes who basically began rising up, but adopted the mantle of previous people, whether they were villains or anti-heroes. And so you had like Punisher 2099 and you had, you know, all these different characters that we knew and loved, but as 2099 counterparts. Now, truth be told, I thought about going back and covering Spider-Man 2099. I thought about going back and, and covering all that stuff. I mean, right now we can't just because we have so much to do. Like we have all this Spider-Man and Spider-Verse and then, you know, all new, all different amazing Spider-Man. And then we transition over to Thor. Then we transition over to the entire Marvel cosmology and the origin of Thanos and the remastering of Infinity Gauntlet and then Infinity War and Infinity Crusade and a million things that we're going to do uh, really going in for the next little while. But I may try to find a place to squeeze in uh, Spider-Man 2099 because Miguel is a really, really cool character. I really love what he brings to the superhero landscape. But the fact remains here that we really just kind of join him in the aftermath of the Age of Ultron. And that's where the future that we're seeing right now, that's where that hails from. One of the big questions a lot of people had is like, how did Galactus from like the main Marvel Universe cross over into the Ultimate Universe? You know, what was going on with the Ultimate Universe during the collapse of the multiverse? All that kind of stuff. So that to kind of sidetrack here for a second away from this, this Spider-Man story, and bear with me here because we're going to we're gonna jump back into it. When Marvel was basically setting the stage for the collapse of the multiverse and basically going into Hickman's whole Avengers and New Avengers and all that kind of stuff, they had this great big huge series, like a lot of these series of events that were designed for the purpose of basically wrapping things up, or at the very least, allowing Marvel to segue into stories that would, you know, basically lead up to the collapse of the multiverse. Original Sin was one of the most notable, in the sense that Original Sin showed that Nick Fury had killed the Watcher, but in terms of uh, Hickman's Avengers and New Avengers, it showed that Captain America was previously part of the Illuminati, and then basically was ousted because he didn't agree with the idea of destroying worlds that were going to crash into to the main Marvel Universe and destroy them both. And so because of that, the Illuminati kicked him out and wiped his memory. And so it created all these really cool stories and things like that. And we'll we'll cross that bridge when we go through our whole following Thanos throughout the history of Marvel's cosmology, all of his stories and everything, going into the remastering of Hickman's Avengers and New Avengers. But the fact remains here that in terms of the Age of Ultron story, uh, what that did is it basically had Wolverine travel back in time uh, and then kill Hank Pym, only to travel back in 
time a second time and stop himself from killing Hank Pym. And so because of the fact that the story was in and of itself crazy in terms of time travel, what Brian Michael Bendis and Marvel did is they said there's been too many instances on too many occasions in Marvel Comics when people have traveled back in time to try to fix things. The time is not some linear construct, time is effectively a living organism. And so by virtue of Wolverine going back in time so many times, he basically broke time itself. That's a lot of times that we're throwing out there. He essentially broke time itself. And so what it did is it sent ripples, it sent shockwaves throughout the entirety of the Marvel multiverse, which set in motion a lot of things and really helped to contribute to the collapse of the multiverse. But in terms of this, uh, this you know, getting back into the Spider-Man, in terms of this future as we see it right now, we don't know exactly what it was that happened. All we know is that the conclusion of Age of Ultron had ripple effects throughout the entire multiverse and it somehow affected this particular universe. Now, the idea here seems to be that again, you know, kind of picking up with Miguel, it's really just, uh, just you know, Dan Slott showing us, here's what Spider-Man is about. Here's what Spider-Man, you know, Spider-Man 2099 does. He's a futuristic version of Spider-Man. His suit's a little more durable. It's got special little goodies that separate him. And, and that's really the way it goes in the realm of the Spider-Man landscape, whether it's Miles Morales in the Ultimate Universe, whether it is, you know, Peter Parker with the Iron Spider armor, whether it's Miguel O'Hara, whether it's Kane, you know, Bill, or I'm sorry, um, I almost said Bill O'Reilly, uh, whether it's Ben Riley, whatever the case may be, it's basically just all these different versions of Spider-Man have something that make them different, something that make them a little unique, their suits or their powers or so on and so forth. And so because of this, what ends up happening here is, of course, Miguel is basically just kind of saving the day. But the reason why is because of the fact that, again, this Age of Ultron ripple event has basically caused a massive catastrophe in the city in terms of the time stream being all screwed up. Now, a lot of this is stemming from Alchemax itself, Alchemax being the mega corporation that basically runs the show. It's almost like a futuristic version of, you know, Rocks on Oil or something like that in the main Marvel Universe, where Rocks on is an extremely corrupt organization that has its hands in all different kinds of politics and behind the scenes, some very shady things, assassinations of public officials, different things like that. Alchemax is very much like that in the future, but it's one of these things where it kind of represents the corrupted nature of, you know, corporations and capitalism and so on and so forth. There's a lot of political themes that went into the original Spider-Man 2099 line of stories, but the fact remains here that within the realm of Alchemax, uh, Tyler Stone is really kind of the guy running the whole situation. But Tyler Stone is the son of Tiberius Stone. And in fact, Miguel O'Hara himself is the son of Tyler Stone. And so because of this, Miguel O'Hara and his father are really in a kind of a battle, like this eternal battle of good and evil, so to speak, in the sense that they fight each other. But what makes the situation a little more dynamic is it would be like if Bruce Wayne became Batman and Thomas Wayne, his father, became the Joker. Like they're just kind of at odds against one another and they will be until the end of time. The issue here is that because of the actions of, of Wolverine during Age of Ultron, something in the past was screwed up. Something in the past went wrong. And so the idea is that Tyler Stone's effectively disappearing from the time stream. Now, what's really cool about this is the way that Dan Slott does it. Under normal circumstances, when we think of the grandfather paradox, which is to say, if you went back in time and you met your grandfather as a child and accidentally killed him, then you would cease to exist. Traditionally, we just have you just kind of break down on, on, you know, on, on the atomic level. You simply just phase out of existence because you couldn't exist in the first place if your grandfather was killed. But the reason why it's called a grandfather paradox is if your grandfather died before you could be born, then how could you have gone back in time in the first place? So again, it creates all kinds of weird situations. But the way Dan Slott does it here is it basically gives us a chance. It basically gives him, a ch uh, gives him time to correct the problem in the sense that in instead of Tyler Stone just vanishing out of thin air, Tyler Stone's basically just sort of disappearing. And so what it tells us is that in the past, there's a sequence of events. There's, you know, the first event, then the second event, then the third event. And we're probably on the second at the moment, which means that the, the closer these events get to the point where, you know, Tiberius Stone, the, the father of Tyler Stone, vanishes, then the closer we get to Tyler Stone disappearing in his entirety. And so because of this, Miguel's basically tasked with the idea of saving the father of Tyler Stone. Now, the reason why this is interesting is because on the surface, Miguel's like, look, you're my mortal enemy. Like, there's no reason for, for me to save you. If you die, the world will be a better place. Well, the issue with this is then we start invoking hypothetical scenarios, you know, hypothetical possibilities. The world exists as it does now in, you know, the 2099 universe because a series of events took place that led it to where it is. Whether or not it's a huge event, whether or not it's a small event, Tyler Stone was born. If Tyler Stone was never born, what would the world look like if Alchemax never, never came to power? It might be better. It could be worse. And so because of this, because of the fact that there's no telling what the future may be, uh, may hold, we end up actually finding out that, uh, that Miguel traveling into the past is guaranteed. And the reason why is because they show an image of him in the past. And so this basically means that he's going to jump back into the year 2013 and try to figure out what happened that set all these events in motion in the first place. Now, what we end up doing is we actually jump back to, you know, again, Peter Parker, Superior Spider-Man. And it's really kind of a cool moment here in the sense that he's playing baseball and he smashes the ball out of the park. <laughs> 
And that's kind of what we would expect, right? Like, like Peter Parker playing baseball. Like I'd never play baseball against Peter Parker. Like I don't care how fast you can throw the ball. He's going to smash it. And then everybody's, you know, everybody's fun is going to be ruined. And so because of that, because we don't like people ruining other people's fun, I would not play against Peter Parker. But the cool thing here is that this entire situation is being monitored by Tiberius Stone. So again, we're back here in the present with the father of Tyler Stone, uh, Tiberius himself. And so because of this, what this really means is that Tiberius is basically engineering the fall of, uh, you know, really of, of Horizon Labs. Now, remember, Horizon Labs is the organization that's basically founded by Max Modell. It's a giant think tank. It's designed to basically grab some of the bright young members of society and have them create inventions and different things like that that will make society better. It's very similar to like Hickman's Future Foundation under Reed Richards. And that's par for the course, right? I mean, in Marvel Comics, and it's, you know, even in DC Comics, you don't have like one organization that represents one thing. Like you don't have like one government sanctioned superhero team. You don't have one, you know, think tank. All different kinds of people have different kinds of think tanks. Reed Richards has a future foundation, which is some of the world's smartest kids that he's allowed in there. Max Modell has Horizon Labs. We'll see Parker Industries begin to take form over the course of this story. You see a lot of different organizations and groups that serve the same purpose, you know, but they're basically just led by different people. Now, it doesn't mean they're at odds. It's not like Max Modell is like, I hate Reed Richards and his future foundation. You know, I'm going to get those evil kids. I mean, it's nothing like that. <laughs> you know, I'm, it's nothing as, 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 <laughs> as silly and sinister as that, but it just serves the purpose of kind of reminding us there's a much bigger world in, in the realm of corporations and companies and so on and so forth. But the reason why, uh, why Tiberius Stone is so significant here is because of the fact that what Tiberius Stone has been doing, or at least what he's done, is he's basically set the stage for Horizon Labs to essentially go under, for Max Modell himself to be arrested uh, due to the fact that the, the different experiments that he's been working on have basically come into, into light as being illegal in the sense that he's tampering with time. Uh, the sense that he basically tried to make, or at least one of the people there tried to make a knockoff of Vibranium and ultimately screwed it up, created Reverbium instead, different things like that. Now, Max Modell wasn't the one who invented these things, but it's a classic example that if you're at work and you screw up, if somebody higher than your boss sees it, it makes your boss look bad because your boss is in charge of you. And so because of that, Max Modell is basically the one taking the fall here because he's the one who's in charge of Horizon Labs. He's responsible for all the different experiments that his employees are working on at the moment. Now, at this point, uh, we're basically kind of reminded by Dan Slott that Goblin Nation is still going on, which is to say Norman Osborn is still making his own Green Goblin army. This isn't wildly significant here. It's just kind of a, a little small reminder, but it's Dan Slott basically saying, you know, keep in the back of your head, guys. Norman Osborn, the Green Goblin, basically found a way to hack into a Superior Spider-Man's little spider bots in order to keep all the goblins in New York hidden away from those bots. They won't know the goblins are there. They won't detect them and they won't report back. And so because of that, it's basically Dan Slott reminding us that, that Superior Spider-Man is completely unaware of the fact that Green Goblin is building an army for himself within the city of New York. Now, at this point, we transition over to Alchem. Uh, and Alchem is basically just the, the predecessor to Alchemax. But the idea here is that Alchem has basically taken over Horizon Labs, or is it really kind of initiating a, uh, you know, a, a hostile takeover? Now, this is basically short for Alan Chemical, but because of the fact that the head of Horizon Labs, Max Modell, is being taken away, essentially what happened here is, is again, by nature of it being a hostile takeover, Alan Chemical has bought controlling stake in, uh, in Horizon Labs. And that's why it's considered to be a hostile takeover, uh, because basically when you have publicly traded companies, the people who have a majority a majority hold in the company uh, have a lot more authority than those who don't. With uh, with Allen Chemical holding the majority shares of Horizon Labs, this now means that Allen Chemical owns Horizon Labs. And so they can dissolve the company, they can absorb the company, they can do any number of things that they want. Now, of course, Superior Spider-Man is very much aware that Tiberius Stone seems to have a hand in this, as is most everybody else, just because of the fact that Tiberius is on with Allen Chemical. And it's like, hey, look, guys, we'll keep you around, you know, if we're interested, you know, if we choose to. But it's really Superior Spider-Man kind of chasing them down with the intention of tracking these guys down. Now, at this point, we actually pick up with Grady. Remember, Grady's one of the members of, uh, of Horizon Labs, and Grady basically came to the idea that in his mind, Tiberius Stone had set in motion these events, which is to say, he believes the Tiberius Stone had sabotaged these different experiments, which is the reason why they had gone awry, and it's the reason for why Max Modell's being arrested in the first place. So, the intention of Grady is to travel back in time and to simply witness what it is that, uh, that Tiberius Stone is doing. Now, this is the inherent difference between what it is that Dan Slott's doing in this story and what we would see in traditional time travel stories. In traditional stories where time travel is invoked, time travel in and of itself is just a way out. It's a way for a writer to get themselves out of a hole. They write this incredibly amazing story and it's super, super good, but then they don't know how to end it. Well, then suddenly here comes Doctor Strange and Doctor Strange whisks them away to the future and then everything's okay. It's one of those things that fans absolutely hate because it's a lazy way to end a story. What Dan Slott does here is he doesn't use time travel to end a story 
story, he uses time travel to further a story. And that's where fans don't really have any problem with it. You know, fans are like, hey, look, if it's a means to an end, which is to say it's a tool to be used in order to give us an organic ending to a story, then that's fine. Then that works. And so what ends up happening here is, uh, is Grady basically just kind of jumps back and starts looking through different points. Now, before Grady can actually enter this device, Miguel O'Hara suddenly jumps through. And again, this really kind of feeds into the idea of Miguel being here in the sense that, you know, the guys at Alchemax in, year, in the year 2099 sent him through this portal because it was a two-way street. It was going to be opened up. It was basically Grady opening the door. And then they knew, at, at least at Alchemax, they knew this door would be opened at this particular time and it would allow Miguel to jump through. And so because of this, Miguel's basically a man on a mission. His idea is trying to figure out what it is that's taking place that's leading to the death of Tyler Stone in the year 2099. Why it is that Tyler Stone is disappearing from existence. And so with Superior Spider-Man catching up to, uh, to, to Ty Tiberius Stone and the intention of killing him, uh, the funny thing here is that Tiberius is like, well, you know, you can't harm me. I mean, you know, you're Spider-Man. You don't kill people. I'm following within the confines of the law. What I'm doing is legal. Yeah, it's really crummy and yeah, it's really shady, but you can't hurt me, right? And this really kind of goes back to the discussion that we had about injustice. You know, free will gives people the, the freedom to do anything they want to, but it also gives them the freedom to deal with the consequences. The consequences may not be legal. The consequences may just be that you piss somebody off really bad and they're going to kill you. That's the consequence of the things that you said and the things that you did. That's what's going on here with Tiberius. He basically pissed off Superior Spider-Man by screwing him over and screwing over the entirety of Horizon Labs. Now, the other half of this is this Dan Slott furthering this idea that Dr. Octopus and the body of Peter Parker is becoming a good guy because under normal circumstances, we wouldn't have seen Dr. Octopus do this. Dr. Octopus would have been like, well, I mean, you know, I'll look at the look at the entire situation, get a lay of the land, and if it's if it works in my benefit, I'll let it happen. If it doesn't, then I'll stop it. But then I'll try to find some way to make sure that I come out on top here. Superior Spider-Man is being altruistic in this situation. What Tiberius Stone is doing is wrong. Horizon Labs is a great organization. Max Modell is a legit guy. Superior Spider-Man is basically going to try to kill Tiberius Stone because he's a dick. He doesn't deserve to live. And Horizon Labs is going to continue on exonerated of the crimes that has been falsely accused of. So that's kind of the cool thing here is this, this is altruistic Spider-Man. Now, the funny thing about this too is that Doc Ock has never met Spider-Man 2099. He doesn't know who Miguel O'Hara is. And this is Dan Slott kind of harkening back to the death, quote unquote, of Peter Parker when Superior Spider-Man basically purged all of Peter Parker's legitimate memories from his mind. The issue here is that when Miguel O'Hara first shows up, Peter Parker's met Miguel before. They've, they've been a team. They've teamed up on a multitude of occasions. Miguel knows who Spider-Man is. He knows Spider-Man is Peter Parker, but Dr. Octopus doesn't know this. And so in his mind, this is just a guy who looks like Spider-Man. He doesn't know where he's from. He doesn't know what he's about. And so Miguel kind of initially greets him as a friend. Superior Spider-Man greets him as an enemy. And so what this does is lead to a fight between the two. Now, in terms of Miguel, he's basically trying to solve this problem. He's trying to figure out what's going on. And so in a lot of ways, what he's doing here is he's looking at Superior, looking at Spider-Man and saying, I don't know what happened to you. I don't know what's been done to you, but you've become more extreme. And if I have to put you down in order to preserve the future, that's exactly what I'll do. Now, at this point, we also have Tyler Stone in the future communicating with, you know, Miguel O'Hara. And this is when Tyler basically says, hey, look, you know, that Spider-Man referenced that guy is Tiberius Stone. That's my father. And so if he dies, I will cease to exist. That's the issue here. Tiberius Stone, somewhere along the line, was killed. And so because of the fact that he was killed, my entire existence is coming to an end, as will yours. And so again, this is Dan Slott kind of meddling around with time a little bit, kind of messing with time itself. But again, it still kind of works. At this point, Miguel O'Hara's role is solidified. We now know exactly what it is that he's doing here. His job is to preserve the life of Tiberius Stone. And the reason why this matters is because of the fact that there is a segment and there, there, there will be a section coming up when Miguel doesn't know if he should. He's like, maybe I should just sacrifice my life and make the future better. You know, I'll let Tiberius Stone die or I'll kill him myself. Tyler Stone will cease to exist and then I will cease to exist. But at the end of the day, it'll all still work out because the future will be a better place or at least I hope it will be. And so in the midst of all this, we pick up with, with Grady. And again, Grady jumping through here, you know, kind of going back in time, it's not wildly significant. All it really does is just confirm the fact that Tiberius Stone was messing around and sabotaging these different experiments that had gone wrong at, uh, at Horizon Labs. And so we don't really need to go super in-depth into that. I mean, that's really the extent of what we would be uh, what we would be discussing anyway. I think kind of the main focus here should be on Miguel and, uh, and Superior Spider-Man. And so the conflict, the battle between the two of them is actually really interesting, is actually really cool in the sense that they're both relatively evenly matched, but Spider-Man 299 has tech at his disposal. And that's one of the differences here, but that's also something that Dan Slott's kind of hearkening on because of the fact that Dr. Octopus took over the body of Peter Parker in Miguel O'Hara's future, Superior Spider-Man is a part of the Spider-Man mythos. It'll be chalked 
chalked up to the idea that Spider-Man became really, really extreme for a little while, but the different tools that Doc Ock used in terms of his time as Spider-Man, his enhancements to the suit, all of that falls into the different studies that Miguel O'Hara has done on Spider-Man. And so whether Miguel O'Hara knows it or not, his role as Spider-Man 2099 is influenced by the things that Doc Ock has done as Superior Spider-Man. And so again, it's really kind of interesting to, to sort of see them meet and to see how one influences the other. But with Tiberius Stone having the ability to basically disrupt Spider-Man's uh, spider sense, of course, what this does is it allows uh, Miguel O'Hara to take off with Tiberius Stone. And of course, you know, following this, it's basically Superior Spider-Man trying to track him down and trying to figure out what's going on. Now, this is the segment when Miguel begins to question whether or not he's doing the right thing. He sits down and he basically says, look, you know, if I let Tiberius Stone die, then that means that he'll never have Tyler Stone, which means Tyler Stone will never have me. I'll cease to exist, but Alchemax will never become what it is. Tiberius Stone will not be able to lay the groundwork for Alchemax. Tyler Stone will never be able to build on that groundwork and the world will not be as crappy as it is. But the funny thing about this is that Miguel O'Hara is not taking into account the realm of possibilities. You know, in a, in a free market system, if Microsoft fails, somebody will take their place. If Apple fails, somebody will take their place. God willing, Ubisoft fails, somebody will take their place. Because of this, what this means is that, you know, Miguel O'Hara could very well be trading one devil for another. And in this situation, the devil you know is better than the devil you don't. And so because of this, he could be making a much worse future. And that's something that he contemplates. He says, look, I don't know what the future would be like. If I cease to exist, if Alchemax cease to exist, who knows how the future could turn out? I mean, who knows if Alchemax could basically restruct be restructured a hundred years from now and it leads Earth into this utopian era. And if I, if I kill Tiberius Stone, that utopian era never comes into existence because people never see Alchemax. They never come to the conclusion, we need something better than that. We can have a better society for ourselves. He's like, I can make things worse in the long run. And so because of that, he ultimately says, look, I have to let him live. And so with this in mind, Tiberius Stone kind of has, you know, upper hand. He has the upper hand here because of the fact that he jumps off the building. He's like, I guarantee you're going to save me. And so he jumps off the building. Spider-Man 2099 saves his life. And so it's almost guaranteed that his future is set in stone. And so because of this, with this story intending to lead into Spider-Verse and with the really the superior Spider-Man run designed to sort of wrap things up and bring things winding down. Uh, what ends up happening here is superior Spider-Man eventually catches up with uh, with Miguel O'Hara. Now, the funny thing here, this is actually kind of a hilarious moment. Uh, Miguel realizing what it is that's going on, realizing that all of reality is basically at the threat of destruction simply because of the fact that one of the experiments Tiberius Stone had messed with was an experiment dealing with time, which in turn would basically lead to the destruction of all things because all the energy being emitted by this time travel device can't be contained. Miguel O'Hara shows up on the scene with Tiberius Stone and says, look guys, everything's beginning to go awry. Everything's beginning to go insane. The only way for us to fix this is to follow my lead. And the reason why is because, you know, Miguel O'Hara is like, look, I come from a future where this happened. And I know that what you guys are going to try to do is fail, but I know the way to fix this problem. And so the issue here is that while he's on the verge, once he, once he says, look, you know, all we have to do is this thing, Superior Spider-Man shows up out of nowhere and knocks him out. And it's a funny moment because then everybody's just like, dude, what did you do? We're like, we're like 15 minutes away from the destruction of the world and the universe itself. Why did you knock out the one guy who could save us? Now, the reason why I say this leads into Spider-Verse is because of the fact that with Miguel O'Hara knocked out, it now falls onto Superior Spider-Man to take to take the lead here. The issue is that again, with him wiping the memories of Peter Parker, he doesn't know how to solve this problem. And the reason why is because of the fact that when the original vibranium experiment by Sajani Joffrey went awry and Peter Parker, as his normal self, basically began manipulating energy in order to contain the energy that was let off, contain the explosion and the destruction of Horizon Labs, uh, Superior Spider-Man purged that memory. And so he doesn't know what Peter Parker did in order to keep that a massive amount of energy from totally collapsing in on itself. And that's what this is. This is basically a much larger version of the energy let off by Sajani Joffrey's attempts to make Vibranium. Remember, we had talked about how, you know, at least during that story, we had talked about how Doctor Doom invading Wakanda, uh, basically taking Vibranium had led to Black Panther, rendering all Vibranium across the world inert, which in turn led to Sajani Joffrey trying to make artificial vibranium. It had all sort of led up to this moment when Peter Parker's intelligence was being demonstrated. Now, Superior Spider-Man doesn't, do, doesn't know what to do. And so he's basically on the verge of being seen as a complete and total fraud. He's on the verge of being seen in a guy, as a guy who doesn't know what he's doing, who's basically making things up along the way. And so because of this, with this massive time device on the verge of completely and totally, you know, obliterating everything, what happens is Superior Spider-Man tells everybody to leave. He starts meddling with the device, trying to find a way to fix it. And then the entire 
entirety of Horizon Labs just vanishes up in thin air, totally disappears. Now, because of the fact that Tiberius Stone was saved by Miguel O'Hara, what this means is that Tiberius Stone is now safe. Or I guess it means that, that Tyler Stone in the future is, is still alive and the future is guaranteed. Now, this was the moment that Tyler Stone was talking about. In this moment right now, things went a different way. We don't know exactly what way things had normally gone in, but what seems to have been the case is that in this scenario, uh, Superior Spider-Man at some point along the line did not tell them to leave. And so the result was that they were all basically yanked through the time stream and Tiberius Stone was presumably killed somewhere, you know, during that time frame. And it led to the destruction of everything, or it led to the death of Tyler Stone or the presumed, you know, death of Tyler Stone, which would have led to this, uh, led to the death of Miguel O'Hara, hence the entire situation, why Miguel is here in the first place. But in this moment when Superior Spider-Man basically vanishes and in the moment that he reappears on the street, the entirety of Spider-Verse took place. That being said, we are going to discuss the whole Spider-Verse event. The issue here is that with the whole Spider-Verse event, it's not an easy thing to sort out. There's actually a lot of lead up in terms of like Morlun and in terms of Ezekiel and the other storyline and you know, the clone saga and all different kinds of, of kinds of things. There's, there's all kinds of stuff that goes on there. Uh, but the fact remains here that again, Dan Slott sort of wrapping things up, bringing things to a close. And one of the things that he wraps up pretty fast is the idea of Mary Jane Watson. Mary Jane Watson had been trying to get a hold of Superior Spider-Man this entire time. And he was basically getting annoyed with her saying, look, she needs to move on. Like she needs to get her life together. She needs to move on, get another guy. She's hung up on me. It's, it's a problem. Well, of course, when she, when he finally calls her back, she basically says, look, I've been hung up on you. It's time for me to move on. I have no romantic interest in you anymore. <laughs> and so it's basically Dan Slott saying, hey, look, these two guys are never going to get together. These two guys are never going to, to be anything significant to one another. Now, from this point going forward, what this does is it basically picks up with the aftermath of Spider-Verse and it picks up with Superior Spider-Man ramping things up extremely fast to basically make a better life for Peter Parker. And that's kind of the funny thing here. At the same time, it's also him trying to make sure that he stays Superior Spider-Man. And we'll, we'll cross that bridge once we get to it with the Spider-Verse line of stories. But uh, from this point, what we're going to do is we're actually going to stop Superior Spider-Man and we're going to jump back and we're going to start covering the Superior, uh, I guess the Spider-Verse stuff. So we're going to jump back to some of the older stories of Amazing Spider-Man and then pick up into, uh, into Spider-Verse. Hopefully that way we have everything covered in order to, to make it all make sense. And then once Spider-Verse is done, we'll jump back here to Superior Spider-Man. It's the best way I know how to do it in order to make sure that we fall into the chronology of the Amazing Spider-Man because that's what all this is. I mean, this is all designed for the purpose so that when the Spider-Man movie comes out and people are searching for Spider-Man content everywhere, they can pick up with these videos and chronologically go through everything about the Spider-Man mythology and learn everything there is to learn in terms of Dan Slott's run with big time going forward, going into all new, all different Marvel. But with that being said, guys, we're going to bring this video to an end. If you are new here to Comics Explained, make sure you guys hit the sub button to become part of the Rob Corps. If you guys enjoyed this video, make sure you drop a like and yeah, <laughs> I will catch you guys later. Peace.